How Jewish is the war against Russia? Let's be honest about who is promoting it. By Philip Giraldi. Published, July 12, 2022. Five years ago, I wrote an article entitled America's Jews are Driving America's Wars. It turned out to be the most popular piece that I have ever written and I was rewarded for it by immediately being fired by the so-called American Conservative magazine, where I had been a regular and highly popular contributor for 14 years. I opened the article with a brief description of an encounter with a supporter whom I had met shortly before at an anti-war conference. The elderly gentleman asked why doesn't anyone ever speak honestly about the 600-pound gorilla in the room. Nobody has mentioned Israel in this conference and we all know it's American Jews with all their money and power who are supporting every war in the Middle East for Netanyahu. Shouldn't we start calling them out and not letting them get away with it? In my article, I named many of the individual Jews and Jewish groups that had been leading the charge to invade Iraq and also deal with Iran along the way. They used fake intelligence and out-and-out -out lies to make their case and never addressed the central issue of how those two countries actually threatened the United States or its vital interests. And when they succeeded in committing the US to the fiasco in Iraq, as far as I can determine only one honest Jew who had participated in the process, Philip Zelico, in a moment of candor, admitted that the Iraq war, in his opinion, was fought for Israel. There was considerable collusion between the Israeli government and the Jews in the Pentagon, White House, National Security Council, and State Department in the wake of 9-11. Under President George W. Bush, Israeli embassy staff uniquely had free access to the Pentagon Office of Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, not being required to sign in or submit any security measures. It was a powerful indication of the special status that Israel enjoyed with top Jews in the Bush administration. It should also be recalled that Doug Fyth's Office of Special Plans was the source of the false WMD information used by the administration to justify invading Iraq, while that information was also funneled directly to Vice President Dick Cheney without any submission to possibly critical analysts by his Chief of Staff Scooter Libby. Wolfowitz, Faith, and Libby were of course Jewish as were many on their staff and Feith's relationship with Israel were so close that he actually partnered in a law firm that had a branch in Jerusalem. Faith also served on the board of the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, JINSA, which is dedicated to nurturing the relationship between the US and Israel. Currently, the top three State Department officials, Tony Blinken, Wendy Sherman, and Victoria Newland, are all Zionist Jews. The head of the Department of Homeland Security, which is hot on the trail of domestic terrorist dissidents, is also Jewish as is the Attorney General, and the President's Chief of Staff. They and their boss Joe Biden do not seem concerned that their client Ukraine is no democracy. The nation's current government came into power after the 2014 coup engineered by President Barack Obama's State Department at an estimated cost of $5 billion. The regime change carried out under Barack Obama was driven by State Department Russophobe Victoria Newland with a little help from international globalist George Soros. It removed the democratically elected President Viktor Yanukovych who was, unfortunately for him, a friend of Russia. Ukraine is reputedly both the poorest and most corrupt country in Europe, witness the Hunter Biden saga. The current president Volodymyr Zelensky, who is Jewish and claims to have Holocaust victims in his family tree, is a former comedian who won the election in 2019. He replaced another Jewish president Petro Poroshenko, after being heavily funded and promoted by yet another fellow Jew and Ukraine's richest oligarch Ihor Kolomoyskyi who is also an Israeli citizen, and now lives in Israel. It all sounds like deja vu all over again, particularly as many of the perpetrators are still around, like Newland, priming the pump to go to war yet again for no reason. And they are joined by journalists like Brett Stevens at the New York Times, Wolf Blitzer and Jake Tapper at CNN, and also Max Boot at the Washington Post, all of whom are Jewish and can be counted on to write regular pieces both damning and demonizing Russia, and its head of state Vladimir Putin, which means it is not only about the Middle East anymore. 
It is also about weakening and even bringing about regime change in nuclear-armed Russia while also drawing some lines in the sand for likewise nuclear-armed China. And I might add that playing power games with Russia is a hell of a lot more dangerous than kicking Iraq around. To put it bluntly, many US government and media Jews hate Russia, and even though they benefited substantially as a group by virtue of their preeminent role in the looting of the former Soviet Union under Boris Yeltsin and continue to be among the most prominent Russian oligarchs. Many of the oligarch billionaires, like Boris Berezovsky, self-exiled when Vladimir Putin obtained power and began to crack down on their tax avoidance and other illegal activity. Many moved to Western Europe, where some bought up football teams while others went south and obtained Israeli citizenship. Their current grievances somewhat reflect their tribe's demand for perpetual victimhood and the deference plus forgiveness of all sins that it conveys, with the self-promoted tales of persecution going back to the days of the Tsars, full of allegations about pogroms and Cossacks arriving in the night, stories that rival many of the Holocaust fabrications in terms of their lack of credibility. Many Jews, particularly younger Jews, are finding it difficult to support apartheid Israel and the constant wars being initiated and fought for no particularly credible reason by both Democratic and Republican parties when in power, which is a good thing. But Jewish power in Washington and across the US is difficult to ignore and it is precisely those Jewish groups and individuals who have been empowered through their wealth and connections who have been the most vocal leading warmongers when it has come to the Middle East and to Russia. Interestingly, however, some pushback is developing. The Jewish peace group, Tikkun has recently published a devastating article by Jeffrey Sachs on the Jews who have been agitating for war. It is entitled Ukraine is the latest neocon disaster and describes how the war in Ukraine is the culmination of a 30-year project of the American neoconservative movement. The Biden administration is packed with the same neocons who championed the US wars of choice in Serbia, 1999, Afghanistan, 2001, Iraq, 2003, Syria, 2011, Libya, 2011, and who did so much to provoke Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The neocon track record is one of unmitigated disasters, yet Biden has staffed his team with neocons. As a result, Biden is steering Ukraine, the US, and the European Union towards yet another geopolitical debacle. Tikkun explains how the neocon movement emerged in the 1970s around a group of public intellectuals, several of whom were influenced by University of Chicago political scientist Leo Strauss and Yale University classicist Donald Kagan. Neocon leaders included Norman Potteretz, Irving Kristol, Paul Wolfowitz, Robert Kagan, son of Donald, Frederick Kagan, son of Donald, Victoria Newland, wife of Robert, Elliot Abrams, and Kimberly Allen Kagan, wife of Frederick. It might be added that Kimberly Kagan heads the Institute for the Study of War, which is often cited in media coverage and even in Congress to explain why we must fight Russia. It has long been recognized by many that a particular antipathy directed against Russia permeates the so-called neoconservative worldview. The neocons are hugely overrepresented at the top levels of government and, as noted above, a number of them are running the State Department while also holding high-level positions elsewhere in the Biden administration as well as in the foreign policy think tanks, including Richard Haas at the Influential Council on Foreign Relations. Likewise, the intensely Russophobic US and Western media, foundations, and social networking sites are disproportionately Jewish in their ownership and staffing. And beyond that, Ukraine is to a certain extent a very Jewish identified place. The Jewish media in the US and elsewhere has been showering Zelensky with praise, referring to him as a genuine Jewish hero, a modern Maccabee resisting oppression, a David versus Goliath. T-shirts bearing his image are being sold that read resisting tyrants in Sfero while the largely orthodox Jewish community in New York City has already been raising millions of dollars for Ukrainian aid. The Jewish Telegraphic Agency reports that a 2020 demographic survey estimated that besides a core population of 43,000 Jews, around 200,000 Ukrainians are technically eligible for Israeli citizenship, meaning that they have identifiable Jewish ancestry. 
The European Jewish Congress says that number could be as high as 400,000. If that is true, it is one of the largest Jewish communities in the world and it includes at least 8,000 Israelis, many of whom have returned to Israel. As US-Russian negotiations leading up to the current fighting were clearly designed to fail by the Biden administration, one, therefore, has to wonder if this war against Russia is largely a product of a long-enduring ethno-religious hatred coupled with a belief in the necessity for a strong American military applied as needed to dominate the world and thereby protect Israel. The neocons are most visible, but equally toxic are the Jews who would prefer to describe themselves as neoliberals or liberal interventionists, that is liberals who promote a strong, assertive American leadership role to support the basically phony catchwords democracy and freedom. Both neocons and neoliberals inevitably support the same policies, so they have both ends of the political spectrum covered, particularly concerning the Middle East and against Russia. They currently dominate the foreign policy thinking of both major political parties as well as exercise control over media and entertainment industry coverage of the issues that concern them, largely leaving the American public with only their viewpoint to consider. There is plenty of other evidence that prominent Jews both inside and outside the administration have been stirring things up against Russia with considerable success as President Biden has now declared insanely that his administration is engaged in a great battle for freedom. A battle between democracy and autocracy. Between liberty and repression. He has confirmed that the US is in Ukraine's war against Russia until we win. How else does one explain the ridiculous trip by Attorney General Merrick Garland to Kiev in late June to help set up a war crimes investigation directed against Russia? As Garland is supposed to be the US Attorney General, it might first be useful to investigate crimes relating to the United States. He might start with American war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan or Israeli war crimes using Washington-provided weapons in Lebanon and Syria, not to mention the human rights violations using those same weapons that occur on a daily basis directed against the Palestinians. Some conservatives are also wondering why the Attorney General spends his time pursuing white supremacists and has failed to investigate the rioting, looting, and killing that rocked the nation in the BLM summer of 2020. Nevertheless, an undeterred and fearless Garland announced while in Kiev that Eli Rosenbaum, Jewish of course, and a 36-year veteran of the Justice Department who previously served as the director of the Office of Special Investigations, which was primarily responsible for identifying, denaturalizing, and deporting Nazi war criminals, will lead a war crimes accountability team made up of DOJ experts in investigating Russian human rights abuses. After the obligatory photo op sucking up to Zelensky, the diminutive but steely-eyed Attorney General declared that there is no hiding place for war criminals. The US Justice Department will pursue every avenue of accountability for those who commit war crimes and other atrocities in Ukraine. Working alongside our domestic and international partners, the Justice Department will be relentless in our efforts to hold accountable every person complicit in the commission of war crimes, torture, and other grave violations during the unprovoked conflict in Ukraine. And if any further evidence was required to demonstrate the Jewishness of that week in Kiev, actor Ben Stiller, also a Jew, visited Zelensky and gave him a big hug. If Eli Rosenbaum is still seriously interested in finding Nazis he will find many more of them in Ukraine than within the Russian army. So, one has to ask whose war is it and who is making it happen. Can you please explain Joe Biden? Or, given your perpetual blank look, should I ask Merrick Garland or Tony Blinken or maybe even Victoria Newland? Philip M. Giraldi, PhD, is Executive Director of the Council for the National Interest, a 501 c3 tax deductible educational foundation, federal ID number number 52 to 1,739,023 that seeks a more interests-based U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. The website is councilforthenationalinterest.org, the address is P.O. Box 2157, Purcellville, Virginia 20134, and its email is inform at This podcast was brought to you by BG Media. 
Download the BG Media app today or visit barglobal.net for more podcasts. Thank mm-hmm. you.